Bueno, gracias por estar ahí. Tuvimos un rápido almuerzo aquí en Buenos Aires. Let's resume after lunch. We have an intensive day with cyber security, cyber security, critical infrastructure, cloud computing. Right now, apart from critical infrastructure and the way to investigate cyber crime, as they explained fairly well in the last panel, the journey is a destination. And we see how we tackle these cybersecurity issues. Right now we have um, a panel with Jocelyn Boscaso, who's going to be the moderator. She teaches at the Institute of Panama. Jocelyn, I see you perfectly well. Not only she's a very good friend, but also she was her mentor for the South School of Internet Governance in Panama, dating back to 2013. I always remember you because that was a very successful meeting and she's very renowned professional for Panama, for the region. And she coordinates a non-for-profit organization that is called Upon the Tech. Probably you can tell us briefly what is Upon the Tech session. And then we have other friends, Adriana Costa, Jose Vega Sacasa, of Integrity, Alfredo Reyes Craft from Lex Informatica Mexico, and Joel Wilfer, Senior Director Online Trust of ISAC. Jocelyn, let me welcome you. Tomorrow we have you as keynote speaker, but today you're going to be the moderator for this panel. I'll be at your disposal for the Q&A. The students are in a different Zoom room. They have in simultaneous interpreting. If they got to follow the simultaneous interpreting, they will continue with, they, they, they can listen to the translation, okay? Thank you very much, Olga. For me, it's a great pleasure to be here. After being one of your students, in the School of Internet Governance. I know that I love you guys, and it's great to be participating in this excellent panel with friends of mine and colleagues that are going to enrich the Internet Governance discussion because you, the topics you're proposing are very positive. Here is called the investigation on cyber crime, what we are and what to expect, especially with the issue of technology. We have evolution and involution of these crimes that are facilitated by these new technologies. So we're going to give the floor to Adriana Costa, the digital crime officer, Interpol, who is going to address for the first 20 minutes addressing this. Hola, ¿se escucha? Bueno, solamente voy a compartir eh, ese slide. Muy sencillo. Sí, hablando un poco de, de lo que decía Rosalí, muchas gracias. Thank you, Jocelyn, for your introduction, for the presentation. Very, very briefly, I'm going to address the situation that we discussed this year while we lived during the pandemic. And you mentioned the issue of evolution and involution. But we don't know if exactly we made progress or not. But in terms of technology, we see new things coming up and things that they may look good, but they're not that good for our daily lives sometimes. Many are critical of social media and other life changers that sometimes, you know, teenagers that are digital natives have seen their lives changed as well. 
where whenever you think that we have that everything is beneficial and these cultural challenges are good, sometimes we don't know if it's better for society. I'm not a sociologist, so I'm not going to talk in this detail. However, I would like to know that I've been working for Interpol and tell you that this change in global society with the use of technologies have resulted in changing the changing crime from the physical world to cyberspace. During the pandemic, we have witnessed a wave of changes. During the lockdown, we have seen many criminal, many crimes. And after the lockdowns, we witnessed violent, violent crimes. However, cyberspace was remained stable and even sometimes increased. Those that are digital native and those that are of few that are not, but are very adept to technologies have seen have been required to adopt this new technology given we're faced with the lockdown and i believe that these technologies are here to come at least for next year and for a long time however crime saw some opportunities because more people are interconnected some people that are known to these technologies so this situation made criminals to commit more crimes in cyberspace. Statistics reveal that cyber attacks are on the increase at the global level. This is a reality. And as you can see that 50% 50, 50 For example, of the UK crimes account for cyber crime. In our region, Latin America and the Caribbean, we don't have such high numbers or statistics. However, we are on the way if we do not raise awareness because we have more violent crimes in the streets. However, we are heading towards facing these statistics in the future. 43% of the cyber attacks impact small, medium-sized companies because they are not really prepared or specialized in cybersecurity, and they don't have measures in place, and those are the ones that are more prone to suffer from these attacks. The company last year said that people are, no, are the new perimeter. In the November conference in Singapore last year, they revealed this data. People were always the new perimeter, and this is highly noticeable these days. At present, 73% use passwords that are duplicate. And 17% of the passwords are one, two, three, four, five, and six, which weakens the security of their companies and in their households. Interpol published a report during COVID-19 in August this year, thanks to the collaboration of the member, the member companies that provide us with information and input, and the member states. They have supplied a lot of information. No country was alike, but it gave us a snapshot of what was going on across the world and in, in every region. We have Africa, Americas, Asia, South Pacific, Europe, and Ina. We've seen fishing 
campaigns related to COVID-19, people are stealing confidential information, proprietary information, ransomware attacks. We've seen that in Argentina and as well as in any other countries that attacked not only hospitals and health healthcare centers, but also telecommunications and industries. Unheard of before, large companies, for example, under attack and institutions that they suffer this sort of crimes. And also child pornography or child abuse material. And these criminals share this information and produce this sort of material. These are not cartoons, but produced with real children. So one of the major issues is fishing. It's not something new, has existed for some time. Fishing in online banking to socially engineered users so they can give away their passwords, usernames, get a loan and then transfer the money out of the accounts, so something regular. The banking industry have put measures in place against these phishing attacks. And one could see that there's enough technology to safeguard with dynamic passwords like tokens or changing passwords like coordinates cards and this reduces the risk of phishing. But not only online banking is account, it could be targeted to the bank employee, public officials, CEOs, when they know that the company is undergoing a crucial major launch, as they know, they are very acquainted with social engineering and what the society, how the society is behaving and they did enough market research and what COVID-19 produced, so they target individuals during COVID. Interpol raised awareness with prevention campaigns against phishing. I'm sure you can see the same presentations, and the same banners in the Interpol website and also a video. And we're going to be keep raising awareness. This year, phishing, next year is crypto hacking, extortion, ransomware and crimes against children or minors that is going to be the most impactful thing twice before clicking phishing emails fraudulent websites may seem legit legitimate at first so be vigilant and be safe fraud include phone calls made by individuals that disguise themselves as legitimate and here is payment claims this is a prevention campaign since it provides interesting tips like for example delete these files prepared the online and offline, strengthen your household network, review and change your password, use strong passwords, match 70%, uses 70 percent, uses the one, two, three, four, five, four, five, six. Review your profiles, lock your profiles, identity theft. Then it produces impact to your friends, Facebook friends as well, or your friends in social media. So you need to ensure the privacy, your privacy as the privacy of others. For example, I talked to my family and nobody had activated the double authentication factor of WhatsApp. So 
basically WhatsApp could be um, stolen. So they have the two factor of authentication. And they use phishing so they can deceive you and with the key. If, uh, if they have the double factor authentication, they can do it. Security and privacy. You know, you need to update the policies. So basically you are safe. This is what I told you before. This is what the police in London said. 85% of the cyber crime is not being reported. When SMEs are, are attacked, they don't even know that they are the target of cyber attackers. This is what I was telling you about. And this is, and sometimes we do not have a clear view of what is going on in cyberspace. So this is the reality. And sometimes I have to know uh, people ask me if I could reveal the statistics of crimes or cyber crime in Panama or Peru because sometimes they go unreported. So it's part of our reality. Either companies do so because of prestige or shame or embarrassment. So this is basically our situation. We do have information and sometimes people do not file claims or report these crimes. I want to stick to the agenda, so I'll give enough time to the rest of the panelists so I can ask speak for an hour. Sometimes I'm asked if a crime happens in a country where the victim is here and the cyber criminal is in another country. So what do you do about this? Investigation starts where the victim is the victim of a crime, you start investigation there. And when we investigate where the cyber attacker was, we start investigation there. So that's the second investigation. We try to catch those criminals involved in cyber crime. International cooperation is key to improve this, as well as communications. When crime was not transnational, it was more simple. However, right now it's a cross-border crime. And if we have a crime in one country and the criminal in, the same crime probably in the same country probably the digital evidence is in another country where they host um, information like for example so right now with that transnational component require companies to adhere to the conventions like the Budapest convention and improve the channels of international cooperation on the basis of every single country that's why we need to pursue along these lines to be more effective and to be more proactive in our investigations. Finally, the prevention and raising awareness campaigns that are important to reduce the number of victims. And not only just put an end to these sort of crimes, but also prevention campaigns to reduce or mitigate the number of victims that is so important. 
So in a way, we need to work on all these fronts. Thank you very much, Adrian. I think that all the aspects related to social or awareness campaigns are very important. And maybe the individuals are the weakest link here. So we need to bring awareness about this topic. Thanks so much for your presentation. Now I'm going to give the floor to Mr. Jose Vega Casa from Panama. I am a member of Integrity as well as the Panamanian Association for Technology and Law. We know that cybercrime is a very complex topic, not only in the sense that uh, many people are not familiar with technology, but also because it's difficult to understand the implications of connecting to internet. From an objective point of view, I can say that nowadays internet is like a war zone. where every second there's a new attack, maybe denial of service or uh, phishing or anything. It's like a war zone where there is no truce, no armistice, no blue helmets. Internet has no exceptions, so since this is intangible, people doesn't realize the danger of using internet. It's not that I'm saying that you shouldn't use internet, but that you should take reasonable security measures because this is, as I was saying, a war zone. I'm talking about uh, cyber attacks. Let me show you this map. All these lines that you can see now are different kind of attacks that are happening right now. We cannot see the, the map that you are showing. Ahora. Can you see it? Okay, este, ya va. Ahora se ve. Can you see it now? Okay. Yes. This is the Kapersky map. It's a public access map. And all these lines that you can see, the color lines, are the different kind of attacks happening right now all over the world. Every second there is an attack, a denial of service, phishing, or malware. 
So imagine if we could see in a tangible way these attacks, we would be living in a war zone. But since these are intangible, we don't get an idea of the danger that these attacks can bring about. Nowadays, data is like the new oil. Personal data nowadays are the most valuable assets that a company may have or even a country may have. Because with personal data, we can have uh, consumer uh, patterns or behavior patterns of a person. And many are, more, are very interested in getting more information about people. Those data can be used for metrics. for public policies, and also criminals use those data for their cyber attacks because cyber criminals realize that it's easier to hack human beings through social engineering than to attack a system. It's easier to uh, ask the human being to give access to a system that attacking the system directly. So this is going to have an impact on the financial statements of the companies because companies had advocated their budgets to cyber security. Let's not think only about uh, the monetary value, but about reputation as well. Nowadays, companies under attack, under cyber attack, and with problems of uh, information theft, are having different uh, consequences that affect them. A company that a public company may be may see its uh, financial instruments affected. We can see here the statistics. The in industries that are investing mo more in cybersecurity are telecommunication companies, governments, retail companies, and banking, the banking sector. Why? Probably because the banking sector is the sector that is having more transformations as regards disruptive technologies. The banking sector, as we know it traditionally in Latin America, is going to undergo changes and it's going to be probably only in our mobile devices. So this sector is going to be the one that is going to invest more in a cyber security to have like an onboarding model so that people can have access to financial products and to ask about any doubts that they may have online. So let's see how a cyber uh, attack works. Cyber criminals are not looking for uh, hacking systems. What they do is to gather information on the target and they develop a profile through different web pages and even when we are 
giving information. We need to understand that cyber criminals are going to use that information to profile a cyber attack. They send an email or a text message. And they are going to, to do identity theft Sorry, but we cannot translate with this microphone. Okay, we'll resume um, the translation with the next speaker. internet porque cuando hablamos de seguridad de la información, tenemos los tres principios básicos, que es la integridad, la disponibilidad y la confidencialidad de estos activos intangibles. Entonces, tenemos tanto riesgos externos como riesgos externos. Riesgos externos, bueno, pues, nuestro negocio, eh, como un ataque de negación de servicio o un malware, este riesgos internos este, que podrían ser fuga de información por parte de colaboradores de la empresa o este, ataques externos, ya sea interceptación de comunicaciones, etc. ¿no? Entonces, en conclusión, miren cómo podemos ver que hasta las grandes empresas de tecnología este, que invierten prácticamente son unos este, paranoicos en temas de ciberseguridad han sido objeto de algún tipo de ciberataque. Esta gráfica es del 2018, pero eh, aquí vemos a Twitter. Twitter, si recuerdan, en este año este, fue un objeto, varias cuentas como la del dueño de Amazon, la de Elon Musk, etcétera, fueron ataques, fueron eh, ataques de, de phishing donde o sea, usurpa, eh, usurparon la, la identidad de eh, estas personas, las cuentas de estas personas, y pidieron donaciones a través de Bitcoin. Entonces, si esto pasa a las grandes empresas, a, la, a, la, a las conocidas Big Tech, ¿qué, qué esperamos, eh, qué, nos espe qué nos depara a nosotros las la pequeñas empresas? Entonces, ya esto eh, eh, tiene que desarrollarse a través de una política pública dentro de cualquier plan de gobierno, de una política pública a largo plazo. No podemos ya tener, seguir navegando con protocolos inseguros, este, el tema de las claves, incluso yo, el doble factor de autenticación muy importante, los temas de, de biometría, ya hay mucho, mucha biometría que está siendo vulnerada, y es decir, este, y todo esto tiene que ir de la mano con la educación y la concientización. Y en base al tema de, de la investigación de, de los delitos, este, vi la, la gráfica que mostró la Diana, y el 85%, eh, en efecto, la, la persona no, no, no decide denunciar. Pero eh, muchas veces es por la misma frustración que siente cuando acude a un ministerio público o a una entidad gubernamental, y esa y entidad, pues los funcionarios tienen toda la disposición de poder querer ayudarlos, de querer ejercer una acción punitiva, pero no cuentan con los equipos y la tecnología para poder investigar, analizar, preservar el tipo, lo que llamamos evidencia digital. Entonces, eh, esto tiene que ser ya un tema de política de Estado, políticas públicas, ¿no? Porque...
obviamente el iter criminis, o sea, el criminal que ha se tiene que dar una garantía culpable. Esa sería mi Muchísimas gracias, doctor, por tan interesante intervención. Eh, Thank you so much for this interesting presentation, but we were having some connectivity problems. It's clear how cyber criminals can use social engineering to hack individuals and to get this kind of information that they need. Now I'm going to give the floor to Alfredo Reyes Craft. He works for Lex Informatica and he's in Mexico. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you, Olga and Adrián, for the invitation. It's a great honor and a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to you. I don't have a presentation, but my idea is to give you some concepts. A day like today, 55% of the population has access to internet at least 100 times through a device or a computer and update their status every 15 minutes. I, so imagine the amount of times that we have the possibility of having access to internet in a single day. To that number, we have to add the internet of thing devices, web servers, mail servers, and many other things. Organized crime or not, like uh, drug trafficking, uh, terrorism, use this technology as well. They uh, encrypt uh, communications, they use it uh, for their crimes, they have complex digital architectures, uh, signal inhibitor devices, and even today, all crimes, some way or another, involve directly or indirectly technology. So terabytes of data are available and can be used to commit a crime or a, a cyber attack. And this is where we see that this discipline of, of forensic uh, technology should uh, have a more important role. Before we talked about uh, uh, hacking disks and to check if the computer was on or off, uh, forensics nowadays deals with more sophisticated problems with uh, devices that are connected to internet, to different kind of extortions, open source intelligence, uh, Internet of Things, devices, industrial systems, cloud computing, and all the other things that we have mentioned uh, today. So the different scenarios to investigate cyber crime may be like a tablet, a cell phone, a website, and focusing on the different uh, scenarios, we can have uh, transnational crimes or in crimes in different jurisdictions. So a single incident is going to require different uh, proofs like uh, proofs that we are going to obtain in different ways. So we are facing some challenges in the cyber crime area first of all dependency can you imagine one day without having access to internet the number of users grows every day 
and also the availability of access and devices. Devices are more powerful and we have access to them, but also criminals have access to devices. So what is the information availability that we have? As Jose was saying, criminals and cyber criminals have information and they gather information from their targets and those targets, we can see that nowadays attacks are targeted. We can see that they are going to attack, for example, the director of Amazon. They have clear goals, targets. There's a lack of control mechanisms that somehow makes cybercrime investigation more difficult. Internet was never conceived as a system, even when it was born from the military sector, the channels and access to information and documents in internet was handled openly. Not encrypted. So everything that has to do with security was included later on to the basic connection of internet. And this is something that makes it difficult to investigate cyber crimes. And the next point is the international uh, scope of cybercrime. This is not easy. International cooperation in investigation is important and it should be better. The next point, a criminal doesn't have to physically be present to commit the crime. And that means that in traditional legislation, there is a problem. The next one, automation, the possibility of criminals to attack in an automated way through bots, uh, different uh, automated phishing uh, attacks. It's incredible. Next, the resources. With less resources nowadays, we can get better devices. For example, uh, criminals are getting more sophisticated devices, better devices. And they use technology to commit their crimes. The speed of uh, data exchanges, resource exchange and uh, child pornography exchange nowadays is faster. And by being faster, there are different conflicts even to detect those uh, problems. So it is important to promote uh, quick uh, data retention as well as information or information logs for the telecommunication companies. We are giving them more, more work by uh, asking them to have controls to keep spam. And if we also force them to retain data for a certain period of time, that is going to be quite long because all legal processes are quite long, then there's an additional cost for the telecommunication company. Another thing is the quick uh, development and the problems of smart devices connected to wireless uh, access points. So the problem nowadays is not so much the computers to which you can include uh, control mechanisms, but for example, the microwave oven that you can connect from home to warm your meals, uh, that connection to your router may endanger all the other devices that you have connected and to uh, be subjected to cyber attacks or 
that maybe your uh, smart TV may be hacked uh, through that. So imagine all the possibilities that there are and also anonymous communication or failure in traditional investigation instruments or tools. So it is important to have cooperation with the different uh, internet and telecommunications uh, service providers. Maybe uh, if we don't have a close relationship to them, we are not going to be able to be successful. We need to have cooperation with the legal system and service providers so that we can investigate cyber uh, crimes. Other issue is uh, the encryption technology that may reduce access in the hands of criminals. It is more feasible that people that use can have encryption technology, very sophisticated encryption, because that same technology could be used to commit a crime. The same goes for knowing full well that they use these technologies and with management processes. Within the legal framework, it is important to serve some challenges or to overcome the challenges because nowadays we're living in a world that is global. We gotta see challenges when it comes to laws and regulations that the criminal code and the legislation should be drafted by the experts or with lawyers that they know about internet internet, or that they have internet expertise will require legal knowledge and technical know-how. And if we do not have that, we're going to be in terrible problems. Identifying some of our own criminal provisions, for example, and redrafting new legislation, gathering expertise, engineers, and lawyers. There's a huge increase on the adoption of new technologies, so it is necessary to have new instruments of investigations where we can develop, for example, procedural schemes to analyze digital evidence. For example, in the city of Mexico or in Mexico, we have criminal provisions for the public sector with chains of custody that they work very effectively. The problem is that usually these procedures are not pursued or followed by some of the institutions in the private sector. Another thing that is very interesting is when we include in the agencies or in the police enforcement officers, for example, the National Guard, in crime scene investigation to have the necessary scientific tools and technical tools to investigate and to prevent this sort of crimes, given a federal context that is for the whole country or in a local country as well, in a local context as well. So law enforcement agencies that become experts in uh, cyber crime, they should monitor and surveil internet, open sources and internet, identify where the incidents are, or any cyber crime or preventive practices creating a culture of self-care as I heard promoting cyber security preventive alerts or early alerts and participating or to train or to have a national center like the CERT in Argentina and to prevent and to mitigate threats, not to put at risk the technological infrastructure that we have in place in our country. So this unit of cybersecurity and the incident response center of cybercrime helps with maintaining 
an ongoing surveillance of the public internet network where there is a possibility of creating a set of communities like being part of the forum for incident response and security teams discussing information with international agencies on new cybercrime threats that were discovered protocols for software and hardware i have four minutes left and i'm going to discuss an experience some experience that was very interesting for the city of mexico that it could be replicated for our students we were part of a working group for the Banking and E-Commerce Commission of the Association of Banks, Banking Association in Mexico. So we had a model that was that the dirty laundry is done at home. That is all the incidents that had to do the targeting in a financial institution was sought to be gathered or dealt with in a cert that was financial, financial cert. So in Mexico, we could create a financial cert in Mexico, just like the cert of the National University of Mexico or the cert of the banks in Mexico. So we gathered some statistics, we did some research, everything was good, up and running, the infrastructure, the creation of the association, the information gathered to connect with the banking association and the interconnection with the CERT. All said and done, but we need to sign an agreement and to share information. Many banks were unwilling to be part of this because they considered that the way that they manage cybercrime risk with cybersecurity risk was a competitive characteristic. So it was absurd. I mean, I want to advocate with the incident response center on cybercrime, but I don't want to share my information to resolve these issues. This was like 10 years ago. I am sure that this scheme or this way of thinking, I'm sure has evolved and has changed, but it is sad because in a way, people was looking at us and said, okay, why am I sharing this information or why did I prevent this potential risk? Because at the same time, it makes me more competitive. That's why I'm going to have more clients and therefore I'm not going to share. So it's selfish. Imagine that other institutions, when somebody was not sharing, would they be willing to share information, especially this financial institute that may seem selfish, will become isolated and will not have access to the main problems or main issues or different ways of approaching a potential incident. So cooperation, being humble or humility and international cooperation are the keys to this. Thank you very much. And Jocelyn, thank you for giving me a chance to speak and I could gladly take those questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation, Alfredo. And what she really said, we call my attention because with robotics, for example, if these devices commit a crime, for example, in the case of self-driven automobiles, who am going to pursue? The equipment, the programming, programmer, the owner of the vehicle? You know, it's something that is going to be widely discussed in the forum. Thank you very much for your participation. And let's continue with Jeff Wilward from the Internet Society.
Muchísimas gracias, Jeff. Thank you very much, Jeff. Interesting presentation. What you mentioned in encryption, encryption, it is used as the objective for when we need to protect the networks of information. Olga, are you keeping track of the time? I think that we should start with the Q and A, right? If they have, if students have uh, questions, probably we can take them. Yes, sure, I'm here. I would like to thank you for the excellent presentations in the panel. The rest of the students are with the simultaneous interpretation and then you go to YouTube. So it's like we have different channels together with YouTube. We have questions from them. We'll go into English for a moment for Jeff. Um, how an organization or another another part of the question, if a government can be part of the coalition or it has to be a civil society organization, and what's the procedure to become a member? Thanks for that question. Um, Governments cannot be part of the coalition, although we work a lot with governments, uh, as you would expect uh, on their policies and so forth. Uh, civil society indus and industry companies and individual technologists uh, can be part of the coalition. I uh, can, I don't know the best way to send out a link, but there's a, there's a form that you can express your interest. Actually, the easiest way uh, is to go to globalencryption.org. That's the website for the coalition. And there is a join us, I think that's what it is, button on the upper right. That takes you to the forum to express your interest and then we'll we'll uh, get back to you. Okay, I, I can share that with, with the audience. If, if I can go on and fix it. Oh, or maybe you can send it to us by email and I can share with them. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jeff. Um, Las, las demás preguntas, I will switch to Spanish now. Las demás preguntas son generales para... The rest of the questions are for Adrián, Alfredo, and for Jose. Now, is WhatsApp encryption vulnerable? There's another one for Jeff. Sorry, I switched to English. What's the most important elements to consider for policymakers for encryption? And if WhatsApp encryption is vulnerable. So I think the most important aspect to consider is the that balance, that risk balance that I talked about. Um, you know, mostly what is under, I would say, under attack with encryption is end-to-end -end encryption because it's hard to see inside what's going on. Uh, and whereas Encryption to your bank, encryption to e-commerce, uh, encryption in email. Most of that is point-to-point -point encryption, as I talked about, and by serving a warrant to the, either the company that's at one end or in the middle, uh, usually you can get access to the data you want. Um, but it's that risk to take into account that getting access over here means opening up potential access bad access by criminals in other nations uh, over here. I'm sorry, I don't remember the second half of the question. Uh, the other was uh, if WhatsApp um, encryption is vulnerable. Yeah, as far as we know, not. There are have been some publicized cases of people getting access to WhatsApp data. That's often because the data was stored uh, in the cloud mm -hmm. unencrypted. So it was a backup kind of data, not the actual communication back and forth. The underlying protocol used in WhatsApp is the same one used in Signal. It was actually developed by Signal. Uh, and so it is thought to be very strong and then encrypted. Thank you very much. I will switch to Spanish now. Uh, para, para Adrián y para... Sí, ¿quieres decir algo, Alfredo? Disculpame. Alfredo, would you like to say something? Yes, and I would like to add something to what Jeff comments. WhatsApp had its policies 
in effect, point-to-point -point encryption, so the communication is encrypted from the device to the server. However, the vulnerability, as Jeff said, is when you back it up, when you back up information. So when you have the backup, conversations are encrypted, but you have keys to that folder to encrypt them. So if a cyber cr uh, criminal has access to the backup, or if you connect your cell phone to some sort of device that can capture that information and extract that information, that key folder or the key saved in that folder could be saved and therefore they would have access to that information. There's another question. In what countries is it compulsory or obligatory to report in the case they fall victims of cybercrime? Mexico is one of them. Victims of all victims of cyber crime is basically reported when they make a claim. However, there are some victims of cyber crime, especially fraud, e commerce, when many people, as Jose said, do not file a claim because lack of knowledge or because they feel embarrassed that they made a mistake just by being socially engineered, okay? Thus, in Mexico, it's not obligatory. It's not a requirement. Olga, I would like to add one comment here. In general terms, in most of our countries, if it's a public official or a public institution, it is required by law. However, in the private sector, almost no country is required report as something personal. It depends on the person or it depends on the company. So they may file a claim or not. I want to clarify that even public institutions sometimes report the crime and many times that involves a discussion in different forms with the certs. CRTs, you know, to keep the platform running and to keep the systems running, sometimes they clear, delete evidence of a cyber crime to provide continuity to the service. If it's a public CRT, they are required to file a claim before cyber crime. Um, in terms of data protection, And this not only goes for Mexico, but for the rest of Latin America and for Spain. Companies that suffer vulnerabilities or that they have fallen prey of these cyber criminals that put at risk personal data of their customers or clients have the obligation or the they are required to file a claim or to report it, or to report it to their clients or to the respective and for law enforcement authorities. But in connection with uh, personal data protection as being accountable or responsible for this data, they should report it. Thank you, Alfredo, Andre. When the state doesn't have protocols to act or SART or CERTs, or where they are now in operation. How can an individual approach this sort of cyber crime attacks? Typically the CRTs, they are operational 24 seven. Now, regardless of this, 
whether it is operational or not, what an individual should do or a company should do when faced with a cyber crime is to review first to check the system and to report this to the ministry that an attack was made and notify the correspondent the corresponding agency and to check the security mechanisms to prevent any further attacks there were cases even in the united states in a hospital with ransomware that they close the exits or the exit doors and they couldn't provide medicine if the ransom was not paid or in a hotel where guests could not take their luggage out of their rooms because the keys were blocked the car keys so so that is i mean the requirement is to file a claim and to take action to prevent any further attacks in the future Okay, so we have questions, but it's for the public ministry, and I'm sure that it's there in the next panel. The last question is, they say that blockchain is a more secure technology. Is that right? Cryptography or encryption is not blockchain. Blockchain is based on a registry that operates with encryption and with hashes and time seal models, time tempi models. Continue, continue. Blockchain is secure because it operates with a distributed computer system, it's not centralized. So it prevents at all times of having CD attacks that is done with technological infrastructure that are called miners. And in this way, they fight forward the load of that package within the network, plus the hash that is the summary of the DNA of the set of files that make up this block. And that's precisely the connection of the link with the following. So if somebody would like to change or wanted to change a part of that block, it would be evident for the rest of them. And you have a backup with all the miners that make up that chain. So it is more secure and very secure. As such, it's been reliable. And some crypto, crypto assets basically are run with this mechanism. I'm sorry, but the connection is not good. We cannot translate. It's not used in the microphone, so we cannot translate this. Sin embargo, la criptografía va a va a generar un, una confianza en la integración, en la integridad, perdón, de la información. Es decir, explicó, toda la información que está compuesta, está compuesta de forma digital. Esa información digital tiene una composición binaria, es decir, está compuesta por bits, que a su vez son bytes, kilobytes, y el hash es el, el resultado, es el algoritmo criptográfico 
que va a generar un código alfanumérico para la composición binaria de esa información digital o de esos activos digitales. Gracias. Que donde se altere un ah, solo bit perdón. va a cambiar todo el, el código alfanumérico. Entonces, realmente... Yeah, I'm sorry, but we cannot translate his talk because uh, he's not used the microphone and the connection is it's pretty re, it's broken up, basically. I will resume the translation as soon as he's done. Este, que han sido colisionados. Sin embargo, el CHA256, que es el que utiliza eh, blockchain, todavía no ha habido ninguna prueba de vulnerabilidad, ya sea por ataque de fuerza bruta o por, como, como bien decía, que eh, el, 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 el ciberdelincuente tenga que controlar el 50, la mayoría simple de la comunidad para poder autorizar una transacción pública. Una más para Adrián. ¿Cuáles son los organismos que trabajan en el análisis de los incidentes con Interpol? What are the agencies that work in incident, in preventing incidents or investigating incidents together with Interpol? I don't think that they are investigating. It's, but I could tell you that we work together with other international organizations like the UN, the OAS, Council of Europe, uh, Asia, Paul. So we're working together with these international organizations and regional ones, and hand in hand with the private sector. Sometimes they provide a lot of information or intel because that information is good for decision making. Also companies from the private sector, I don't know if I can mention them here, but these companies work with malware, cybersecurity companies, like Cecil. In Mexico, we have members like Citum, it's a cybersecurity company, also banking, banks, banking institutions, and some individuals that work in our office in Singapore, where we have the cybercrime, Interpol cybercrime unit, where we have people from the private sector, where we analyze the intel or the data that we receive. So sometimes we write reports, alerts, models operandi, alerting the 134 countries that are members of Interpol. How about a new ransomware or ransomware campaigns targeted to the health sector during the COVID-19 pandemic? They probably, they were alerted in a region and later published by Interpol to raise awareness. Some of those cyber attacks that are published on an ongoing basis by us, so we can communicate this information effectively. Sometimes that information does not reach the far corners of the world, so we're working on that. And that's why we have a public and private association and also partnerships with academia that allow us to communicate the effect of this information and raising awareness campaigns and some uh, communication campaigns that we have underway. Good. Probably if there are pending questions, I'm sure that they're going to be addressed by other panelists later on. Thank you very much. Thank you for moderating the panel. Thank you, Jeff. Many thanks. Alfredo Jose, Adrián, it's a pleasure to have seen you here. Hope that you stay healthy and safe at home. We're all safe here. So hopefully, I see, I will see you. I look forward to seeing you in the future. Greetings from Oscar and Adrián. Thank you very much. And um, we're going to break for half an hour. 25 minutes and we will resume at 4.30 with the 
last two keynote speakers.